Welcome everyone. My name is Anna Post and I'm the Director of External Relations and Council Communications at NCSS as well as the C3SC Grants Project Coordinator. Tonight's webinar is titled Meeting the Common Core for ELA Part 3 Argument Writing. This webinar, along with others in our series, are part of the College Career and Civic Life Framework for Social Studies State Standards Literacy Collaborative, or C3LC, which NCSS is implementing in collaboration with the National Center for Literacy and Education, and which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The goal of this initiative is to create and operationalize a plan designed specifically for social studies teachers to implement the Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts by utilizing the C3 framework. This webinar is produced in conjunction with an in-depth investigation that can be accessed by C3LC project teacher groups at the Literacy and Learning Exchange site. Non-project participants will also be able to access the project activities and learning modules at the Exchange site or at the NCSS C3LC webpage. Links to these web locations will be provided at the end of the webinar. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's presenter, Dr. Shansi Montesano. Dr. Montesano is Associate Professor of Educational Studies at the University of Michigan. Her scholarship centers on the teaching and learning of historical writing. She examines how adolescents learn to write reasoned historical arguments, develops history curriculum that supports students' writing, and studies how teachers learn to teach historical thinking, reading, and writing. She was a founding member of the Stanford History Education Group. She was part of the team that created the award-winning website, Historical Thinking Matters, and was one of the C3 Framework lead writers. Dr. Montesano, thank you for being with us today and doing this presentation. Thank you so much, it's great to be here. Welcome everybody, I'm very happy to be working with you today. I'll just give you a little overview and then we'll jump right in. In this investigation, we'll work on how to help students write arguments in social studies. And we will um, work through a lot of different ideas. I will do a lot of talking, and I've hoped to bring in some interaction through a few polls that we'll have throughout our time together, as well as a Q&A session at the end. Um, and then following this one hour, there will be a series of activities um, that you can engage in on your own or with colleagues, and those will be accessible soon on the Literacy and Learning Exchange website. So um, welcome again, and thanks for being here. So this session focuses on argument writing in social studies, and to get an idea of what we're aiming for, I'd like to share one example of a student's written argument. Uh, I'll sh this comes from the Historical Thinking Matters website, um, which you can access at this, at this URL if you wish. Um, the student wrote in response to this prompt. The prompt says, some books say something like this. Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat to a white man. African Americans heard this and decided to boycott the buses. But this is a brief description of a complex event. Write a more complete answer to the question, why did the boycott of Montgomery's buses succeed? So that's the question posed to the student. And the student in response says a number of things, and this is one excerpt. And again, we're just looking at this to get a sense of when we're talking about argument writing in social studies, what are we talking about? And this is just one example. So this student wrote, it's very common to hear that the incident where Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white man is what started the Montgomery bus boycott. However, this is not the case. Though Rosa Parks' arrest was the crowning incident in the history of civil rights and may have been what got the boycott started, the plans for a bus boycott had been talked about months earlier. This event was a highly organized and determined effort and planned through very carefully. A year before the boycott, discussions of changing the bus laws were proposed to the Montgomery City Council. These propositions were addressed, but only some of the laws were slightly changed. Quote, buses have begun stopping on more corners where Negroes live than previously. However, the same practices in seating and boarding continue. And this is quoted from a letter by Joanne Robinson, who was the president of the Women's Political Council. 
So in this example, from student A as we're calling her, uh, the student has identified a common claim that Rosa Parks stored, started the bus boycott and then challenged that claim saying that's not the case. And I've underlined here what I see as her thesis or her claim that she was Rosa Parks was important, but it wasn't what um, led to the success of the boycott all by itself. Um, and in a box there, you can see some of her reasoning. She's putting some context into play here by saying there are other things going on before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. Um, so that's some reasoning that she shares to support her claim. And then what's circled is some evidence to support her claim. Um, you also can see the stars where she's using some words and phrases, however, this is not the case, um, a year before the boycott. And those words and phrases create cohesion from that link the different ideas in her um, essay excerpt. So this is an example of what you might see uh, in a student's argument writing, it's um, you, you're going to see obviously a huge range in your own student's work and one of the follow-up activities is to, to really see where are your students with argument writing. Um, but I share this one because this student's work reflects num a number of the expectations for argument writing that are laid out in the Common Core uh, standards for English language arts, history, social studies, science, and other technical subjects. So I'm using uh, here is an overview of, of writing on page 63, and you can see um, one of the core standards is to write arguments as a text type, um, but there are other parts of the common core standards for writing that are reflected here. Um, produce clear and coherent writing in which the development, organization, and style are appropriate to task, purpose, and audience. Develop and strengthen writing as needed by planning, revising, editing. This was actually part of a process which you don't see here. Um, there were a variety of, of different research uh, activities going on in this classroom. So you can see a number of the common core standards about writing broadly here. And if you look more specifically at what writing arguments means in the common core, this is for grades 6 through 8, um, this student reflects A, B, 1A, B, C, and D, where she's introduced a claim about a topic and she's distinguished her claim from opposing claims. Um, in B, she supported that claim with some logical reasoning, which was what it was in the box, as well as some evidence, which was in the circle. Uh, the stars indicated words and phrases and uh, that created some cohere cohesion and clarified the relationships among the claims and reasons and evidence. Um, and throughout, she established and maintained a formal style. So uh, this is just an example to illustrate aspects of the Common Core that come into play when we're thinking about teaching argument writing. So in this investigation, um, we'll explore what you can do to support students' argument writing and learn to integrate key aspects of argument into their writing, um, as this student has done. You'll see that working on argument writing with students relies on an inquiry approach to teaching social studies, as well as an emphasis on literacy. So it's not just a matter of inserting a day in every unit where students have an opportunity to write, but also thinking through those units and making sure that students have a chance to ask questions and to read sources to support the writing that they do. Um, so as a result, working on argument writing in social studies classroom also integrates the expectations of the C3 framework for social studies state standards um, because inquiry is so essential to teaching writing. So this is an excerpt from the C3 framework that gives an overview of the four dimensions um, that frame what inquiry is all about. Um, and this aspect, particularly in dimension four, is about communicating conclusions. That's the outcome of all this work that we might see in students' argument writing. So throughout this investigation, we're going to view some video clips, um, look at some different teaching practices and examples of teaching practices that support argument writing. And I hope as you have questions and comments that you'll use the chat uh, box in the Adobe Connect to share your thoughts. And we'll also have some stopping points for polls where you can uh, share your thinking as well. So our first poll to get to 
um, some, a little interaction is uh, it's helpful to know for me to what extent are you comfortable working with students on writing a claim and supporting it with evidence and reasoning or explanation. Um, so there's a place where you can um, enter your thoughts there. And some folks are still entering. Okay, so I'm seeing a, a number of people are, are very comfortable and um, we also have a good group of people who are somewhat comfortable so hopefully you'll be able to bring some of your ideas to the table and share them in our in our chat as you respond to some of the ideas so let's dive into teaching practices that support student growth and argument writing um, and I'll just say that the ideas in this presenta presentation have come from different research projects that I've been involved in both at the high school and middle school level where I have seen uh, positive changes in students' argument writing in the context of social studies classrooms. Um, so an overview of the kinds of practices we'll talk about, I, I put them into three bins, if you will. One bin is do history and social studies with students, and by that I mean get involved in inquiry, investigate questions, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Um, the second area or bin of ideas for teaching argument writing is to help students analyze, sort, and organize their evidence. Um, there's a When students get into writing arguments, they, they need to look at different evidence to have something to say, uh, but they also need help sifting through all of that evidence and making choices about what to include and where. And the third bin of ideas of, uh, regarding teaching argument writing is about providing explicit instruction in argument writing. Um, that may seem obvious, but for kids, uh, they're often looking for um, us to be much more explicit than, than we tend to be. And so we, I have some ideas to share there. And of course, you may have ideas as well. So as much as possible through the chat, please do. Okay, so first let's talk about setting up students to do history and social studies. So what do I mean by this? Um, I, I put this in the, at the forefront uh, because it's very difficult, if not impossible, to teach argument writing if there's nothing to argue. If students believe that history and social studies are given information, that they just need to memorize that information, uh, then there's, they don't see any room to make an argument or to make a different interpretation. Um, th this is not to say that information is bad. There are things that students should know, um, but there also needs to be room for students to have different interpretations. And without that, it's going to be very difficult for your students to see how they can write an argument. So it's an important starting point. Um, some strategies for doing this uh, would include presenting social studies as an inquiry-oriented subject by posing questions that can be answered in multiple ways and giving students a chance to read sources that present multiple perspectives. So let's look at some, what I want to do right now is have you watch a video and think of what are some examples you're seeing of central questions that have multiple possible answers and what are some examples of documents or source sets that students are working with to help them think about those questions. So let's take a look at this video. <laughs> So I think a really effective approach is to like pose a controversial question um, or a question that really can have different answers. And so when you pose that question to the class, that's the, sort of the grabber. This is why we're here today. And the question is, was the U.S. planning to go to war with Vietnam before the Gulf of Tonkin? You first need to start with an inquiry question that, is, that has a rich amount of answers. And then you would give out the primary source documents that they would use to like gather evidence for both sides. Our question that we are focusing on is what is the true story of the March on Washington, trying to have a complete picture of it. So the question hooks the students so that they have a purpose to the class. Um, by having uh, this focus question, they know the direction of what they have to do, and they understand that it's, the answer is not going to come from me, but it's going to come from documents. It's going to come from the history itself. Now, again, our focus is going to be 
Was President Johnson going to go to war anyways? Was it really this event, the Gulf of Tonkin, or had he already planned to go to war? And I would say that I've seen a change in their interest level in history, that instead of it being these facts that we memorize, it's this, wow, we're going to solve a mystery or we're going to answer some sort of question. Um, and so usually when I put up the question, you know, they'd be like, oh, look at the question today. And, th and that drives that excitement. Have an inquiry and argument. Where do you see the spaces? If you're thinking from the student's perspective, where do you see the spaces for students to get involved in inquiry, get involved in argument? And while that poll um, number two is going up, I also wanted to point out what Scott just shared was using meal paragraphs. That's something that some teachers used in a school that we worked in um, to give students kind of a, a structure for writing arguments in a paragraph format where they have their main idea, their evidence, their analysis, and their link. How, how did their um, evidence link back to their main idea? So there's a poll there if you had any reactions to the video in terms of thinking about focus questions as they put it or central questions if I, as I've put it um, or in the um, C3, we use the term compelling questions a lot. Right, okay, so one, yeah, one person is, these are some good responses that are helpful. We've got no right or wrong answer, um, which is really important. Uh, this, the question that you use to drive your inquiry, which then drives the writing, which is where we're heading, um, kind of models the type of thinking in, that we want students to do. And so having no right or wrong answer is a really important signal to students that there is a space for them to have an argument. Um, they are open-ended, um, and they injecting doubt is a great way of thinking about it, too, because it makes kids really, they're forced to think about it. They can't just assume, I, I just am going to repeat everything we've done. So, um, And that's also a nice idea that they it gives students a chance to ask additional questions um, you usually have to break down one of these bigger, compelling questions into smaller questions, as as um, S.G. Grant has laid out the language of compelling questions and um, supporting questions. So those supporting questions or subsidiary questions help them address the topic. Yeah, and another way to ask a question is what what about significance? You know, people ascribe different if it's about causation in history or. Um, other things, you know, what, what is significant in history? What's the most significant cause of the Civil War? There's people disagree on that. So even though you can turn a question like, what were the causes of the Civil War, which for students can turn into a list of information, um, if you change it slightly to ask what was the most significant cause of the Civil War, then they're really more in a position to write an argument. And uh, they still will tell you if they understand a lot of the different causes, but they're also framing it slightly differently. Um, so they, they are in a position then to make an argument, select evidence that supports the argument. So let's take a look at just some of the examples. Um, in We had the Gulf of Tonkin question, was the U.S. planning to go to war or not? And then the other piece, in addition to the questions, was the text sets or documents that go with the question. And this is another key piece in the setup that, again, I, I know we're Right now, it feels like we're, we're not talking about writing, but to me, we really are. This setup is super important because the evidence drives what students are able to say um, in their writing. And so the fact that we have documents that present different ideas that conflict gives students the chance to um, go back and forth between the documents and think through how would they respond to this question. So the contrasting perspectives is, is also really important. And it's as important as asking an open-ended question. Um, what can happen when, t when, when I'm first diving into a topic, um, I just did this about a month ago, uh, when I'm diving into a topic for the first time and creating curriculum, and I might come up with a question that is open-ended and is debatable, but then the sources I find really land more on one position or another. Um, that also is a danger it conveys to students that there's only one right answer. So having multiple sources that don't all say the same thing or point to the same answer is very important. Um, this is from the Historical Thinking Matters website. This is the question that this first student whose writing we looked at responded to. Why did the boycott of Montgomery's buses succeed? And some examples of contrasting sources. Um, so, so good questions of multiple possible interpretations. 
hopefully they are pushing students beyond summary and towards analysis. Hopefully they are illuminated by evidence, so it's not something you can just automatically respond to, but, um, or maybe you can, but you can give a much better response if you uh, look at evidence. So a few things to wonder about is how you pose the question. Sometimes it could be an open-ended question like why did something happen? Um, but it could also be a question that has a yes or a no answer um, that gives students a little bit of an easier way into argument, but may not have pushed them to consider all the different historical factors. So that would depend on where your students are, are coming into this work. Um, all right, let's keep moving. So I'm going to move past this poll because I think we've talked about some good debatable questions and move into some good source sets. We've talked about presenting multiple perspectives and supporting more than one interpretation. The last piece is just making sure these texts actually are aligned with the question that you've asked. Um, and that's surprisingly difficult sometimes because some, sometimes there are different, um, different, different ideas come out of those texts. Um, I'm just noticing what what Kenny is sharing, and I think that's a good point too, um, giving students examples of how historians support a different thesis or idea about history, for example, the decision to drop the atomic bomb. So they're seeing that people who study this a lot can make different interpretations is another way to model there it's possible to come up with your own argument, but also to see how they come up with those arguments. Um, so that's a great idea. And Robert Crowley's book is a good one for that. Scott's sharing. Thank you. OK, so some ideas to consider. What are your students' grade levels in terms of what are you tying your reading level to? Um, what background knowledge do they have coming in that they might be able to use to connect to this topic? Um, how do you help your students get oriented to the text? And what information in the sources are key to the investigation? Or what could be left out if you're going to shorten them? Oh, Cowley, what ifs. Yes, that, now I know what you're saying, Scott. So Robert Cowley's book about what ifs of American history is a different way to pose questions. Thank you. OK, so this is one example from Historical Thinking Matters about how you might prepare documents. So it's wonderful to find documents, and, and then we have the question of making sure they're, um, work, that your students can work with them. One thing that helps a lot is giving head notes and source lines at the top and the bottom. And then editing them down so that you might choose an excerpt of a document and insert some ellipses where uh, to indicate that you've taken some, some things out. If your students really struggle with reading, things like ellipses can be, can be quite difficult. Okay, So if you have good ideas about where you go to find sources and texts, will you share them in this poll? Um, that's coming up right now. And the other point I want to make while you're responding to that is that one of the follow-up activities um, for after this webinar focused on argument writing that will be posted on the L Literacy and Learning Exchange site is to um, get a text set and a compelling question together, either creating your own or um, or finding one that already exists and there are a set of websites on that, um, and these are some good ones too, National Archives, Library of Congress, great sites. Um, and you can find things that are already created as lessons, or you can, like choices, curriculum is a good example of that. Um, the Stanford History Education site is another, World History for Us All is another. Those are already created, and then there are places like Gilder Lehrman that just came up, um, or Library of Congress, National Archives, um, what else? The Fordham the Modern History, World History Sourcebook. All those have primary sources that you can pull and put together. So we've got some great ideas here. Right, as a civics teacher, definitely finding um, current news issues or sometimes um, cattle archived ones on, on um, to get some background on current issues. And I would add CNN sometimes has some really good um, background uh, in addition to the ones listed here. Okay, so these are all ideas about doing history. Let's move into now helping students analyze, sort, and organize their evidence. So the first bit of ideas was getting things set up so that students are in a space where they can make an interpretation or an argument 
Um, they can look at different ideas and, and gather them and, and develop their own interpretation. This bin of ideas related to argument writing is that um, is all about helping students analyze the evidence, sort through it, and organize it in a way that helps them put their argument together. So there are three ideas related to this um, category. One is to structure reading with a focus not only on re basic reading comprehension, but more advanced comprehension that includes making inferences, analyzing, things like reliability. Uh, is this an author we trust? things like that. And there are different structures to do that, and I'll just share a few examples. Uh, providing time for discussion of that compelling central question and the texts that are shared is, is also a very important way of processing the ideas of helping students to build on each other's thinking and develop their own thinking. And then keeping track of the ideas in the different texts and in the conversations that students have using some form of graphic organizer. So we'll watch a video about uh, to represent this set of ideas. And here's a good place to uh, pay attention to the opportunities for students to analyze, sort, and organize their ideas. In my classroom, we focus on reading sources, understanding sources, um, and applying those skills to answer big questions. And the discussion is usually the, the best part, and sometimes it doesn't always happen in every lesson, but it usually can come at the point of, at the end of a unit. How can we have students debate these questions? And you know, um, and I, you know, I either have a full class discussion, or sometimes I'll have them the debate at their table uh, and try to come to some answer. We try to have them come to some sort of consensus. So we're going to talk about why did people's opinions of the Vietnam War change? Um, were they for social reasons, for political reasons, or for economic reasons? So before our full discussion today, um, we're going to look at two very famous people um, as to um, their opposition to the war. So John Kerry, who we know later will run for president, testifies to the U.S. Senate, right? He was a veteran. He had three Purple Hearts. Um, we would assume that he's going to say... Good things. Maybe good things, right? That's what we're going to assume. And look, he's in the military. He served. Let's look and, and follow along as I mark up this document very quickly here about of John Kerry. I would like to talk on behalf of all those veterans. In our opinion, from our experiences, there is nothing in South Vietnam which could happen that realistically threatens the United States of America. What is he saying? Should we be worried about communist? No. Doesn't sound like it. So what kind of reason would this be? This would be a political reason. He's saying they're not a threat. And the intent was I wanted them to pick a side. Did they think it was political, social, or economic that really drove people at the time to oppose the war? Right now in your heads, I want you to think about how would you answer this question. Why did people oppose the Vietnam War? Was it mainly for social, political, or economic? And you know how a philosophical chair works, right? You're going to go to one side of the room. You're going to give your evidence. And at any point, if you feel somebody, that was a really good point, Valerie. I'm going to move over there because I agree with her. You can do that at any point. The basis of philosophical chairs is that you're posing a question to students. And for which there usually is not a correct answer, and they get to think about it. And the structure is that the question is posed, and they have to take a side. All right, historians, when you're ready, you may take all of your things with you. Social, political, economic. And then once they've had a few minutes to think about it, they physically move. And it might be an agree, disagree. It might be uh, pro, con, whatever it is. They physically move to that side of the room. Okay, that's the, but no one's going to be economic. Interesting. Maybe I'll convince you to move over there. Is there somebody who would like to start first to make their point? Remember that you can't talk until three other people on your side have spoken. And your idea is to get people to agree with you to move over to that side. Okay? Who would like to begin? So, yeah. I, I believe it is social because, like, um, before, people really supported war only because of they think the U.S. is doing good. But then it's like ever since the, um, the living room war came out where they brought um, actually media to the living rooms of people in the U.S., I guess people feel for them like they could be like, what if this was me? Would I support this too? And then like, so I guess that question really affected most people and probably that's, I think that's why it's social. 
Okay, so I'm going to have a political person. So he makes a good point. Can you give us a reason why you think that the political reasons would have been um, more influential on people's at the time? Or why they might have thought it was more political than just this um, TV war? I think it was political because the citizens of the United States uh, just disagreed with the war because the presidents were... So that's just an example. Um, I thought I'd cut it off there because they continue, and it's really nice what you end up seeing is students start to change their ideas through the course of the discussion. And we're going to have one more, another poll here. And again, the focus is where do you see the spaces for students to organize their ideas, to analyze and sort through the different ideas? Um, and would you add anything or do you have other suggestions for how to give students these opportunities to, to think through all the evidence that they are working with? Oh, nice. And Paul has shared a link to the past by Michael Yell, which is a nice explanation of the philosophical chair strategy. So it's one strategy for discussion that achieves this goal of giving students a chance to process ideas. Okay, well, let's keep moving forward. Specifically about structuring reading as one way of helping students with uh, their work on the evidence, or thinking through the evidence. So there are different ways to do that. One way of doing that is to give students support in developing the background knowledge that is relevant to the particular investigation. Um, this is one example that was used in the lesson on the Gulf of Tonkin. That's a timeline. Um, so students can have a little bit more specific historical context. Um, there's an, another way of thinking about students' background knowledge, and that is thinking about what students bring to the table and what their understandings and ideas are that relate to perhaps war or per, what they might know about Vietnam specifically um, or um, you know, other topics that are related to this. So there, there are different ways to think about background knowledge, but when they're reading on a particular topic, having specific information in, um, in their toolkit about that topic will support their reading. Um, there are other, uh, another way to think about supporting students reading is to provide them with questions. Some people do this by having a standard set of questions on a poster that they use every day for any time that they work with a primary source. This is an example of a set of questions that are specific to the particular documents that are being used and this is another one where there are specific questions for each document. Um, this particular set of questions highlights historical ways of thinking with documents, so there's attention to sourcing, so thinking about the author and how the document came into being and contextualization, situating that document in time and place. Um, so there are different ways that you can ask questions. Um, I've seen in my own work it's important to ask questions uh, that focus on basic comp levels of comprehension but then also pushing the inferences at uh, another level of analysis that gets into historical thinking if it's history, um, civic thinking if it's civics, economic thinking, you get the idea. So it depends on exactly the text and the questions you're asking, the, the ways you want students to analyze. Uh, but these are different supports for reading in addition to preparing the document themselves. That's, um, I, this is another really helpful piece of background to bring in that Kenny's sharing that with if you're studying the Vietnam War is to put the opinion polls in there alongside key events in Vietnam because students are really quite surprised. Generally, there's sort of negative thoughts about Vietnam at this point, but at the time it was a very heavily supported war and that's an important part of background knowledge that students may not bring to the table because of how we think about things now. Um, so that's a good example of bringing in background knowledge. So another aspect of supporting students as they're sorting through the information is what we saw in the video, some discussion of inquiry questions and the sources. Um, in addition to the philosophical chairs, I'll share the SAC, the Structured Academic Controversy Model. Um, the, one of the earliest articles I've seen on this is by Johnson and Johnson, and I share that in the, at the end, um, Walter Parker has written a lot and has some great articles about um, structured academic controversy as well. Um, but the basic idea is that you put your students into groups of four, and then within that group of four, ask them to work with one person in the group. So there are two pairs within the group of four. And you need a question that has a yes or no answer. 
Um, one that I use a lot in teacher education is, uh, was Lincoln a racist? And that has a yes answer and a no answer, most obviously as a, as a direct response to the question. And so within the team of four, I ask two students to prepare uh, by finding all of the evidence to support the argument that Lincoln was a racist. And I ask the other two people in that team to prepare by finding all of the evidence to support the argument that Lincoln was not a racist. And that is a way of, to me, of scaffolding the reading, of, of having students look through the evidence to see what evidence is there to support these different arguments. And then they work together as a team to, pr to pre present the ideas that they found. So two people share all the evidence that they found for the argument that Lincoln is a race, was a racist. Uh, then the other two share the evidence they found for the argument that Lincoln, Lincoln was not a racist. And they check in to make sure everybody's heard what they've said. And then you get to the most important part of the structured academic controversy, which is called consensus building. And at that point, the team of four works as a team and they don't stick to any position that was presented. Um, they work together to try to come to a consensus about this question of whether or not Lincoln was a racist. And their goal is to find the argument that is best supported by the evidence. Um, so that's a shift away from debate to truly deliberating about the evidence and thinking about what evidence really supports the argument. And it's a really important way of thinking when you're asking students to write arguments because they'll need to get in the habit of linking evidence to a claim and an SAC sort of trains them to do that. Initially, when you try an SAC, if you've not used it before, it can take a little time for students to get used to it because they really want to debate. They want to stick with their position they were originally given. Um, and so that takes a little pushing them to, to realize the goal is not to win, but to um, come to consensus. Uh, and as Tom is sharing here, the SAC has been useful for his students to verbalize both sides, which is really good. So you have to recognize that there's more than one way of looking at this question. Um, yeah, street law also. And thank you, Mary, for sh sharing that. Street law has a really good step-by-step -step guide for SACs. Um, Another model of discussion is an inquiry model where uh, you have your focus question and ask students to share what their initial hypotheses are before they've read any evidence at all. So they give their initial guess or initial claim um, and then have students look at a round of evidence and deliberate with a small group about that evidence and then go back to the initial hypotheses they had written out um, and decide if they would like to revise it based on the new evidence that they've read and um, how they would like to revise it so that it reflects the evidence. And then you can continue doing that with multiple rounds of evidence so that students get in the habit again of thinking about a question, coming up with an initial idea, and then seeing evidence and changing their ideas based on the evidence that they see before them. So again, these discussion models help with really pushing students to use the evidence and, and in support of claims that they're making and make sure the claims they're making reflect the evidence. Um, but through discussion, students are also becoming much more familiar with the evidence and understand it much better and see different ways of looking at both the evidence and the question itself. And so they're learning from each other and through talk. Um, so that's an important way of supporting students' writing. The last piece within this set of ideas is keeping track of ideas and comparing sources using graphic organizers. So as students begin to write, uh, if they're writing in response to a question, they're looking usually at more than one piece of evidence, doesn't need to be more than two necessarily, but to have some contrast and see different perspectives to see that there are different ways to interpret this question, usually they're looking at at least two pieces of evidence. And again, doesn't need to be more than that. Um, but that takes a lot of uh, mental work to think across these different sources or documents that students look at. So there are different ways to help students with that. Uh, this is one example here. This is from an inquiry lesson where you can see that here was a, at the top a space for the initial hypothesis 
and then students looked at a document by Martin Luther King Jr. and they shared some ideas about it. Um, and, and then a, um, a document by John Kerry shared some ideas about it here, took some notes. Um, and then they came back to their hypothesis and revised it. So this gives students a space to keep track of the key ideas that are coming across to them from the documents and think across the documents. Um, this is another example from the Montgomery Bus Boycott lesson. There are three texts represented in this first column. Each row is a, a space for students to share their ideas. And then one more example there. So. Um, I think in the, for the sake of time, I'll keep going instead of watching one more video. Um, and um, we're going to look at um, another set of ideas, which is teaching argument writing explicitly. But before we go there, um, there were a couple of ideas in the chat that I wanted to highlight. Um, the Library of Congress teaching with primary sources analysis sh worksheets are really helpful in getting students to analyze documents, and Kenny shared those. Um, okay, so so the last sort of bin of ideas is, okay, now we've set students up for inquiry, for developing an argument. They have both a compelling question that is debatable, that people could disagree with their response by giving a different response. They have some sources or documents of some kind to interact with and think through that informs their claims. They've had support in thinking through those sources and um, making sense of them and organizing their ideas. Now they're ready to write, and there are some specific supports that come in at this stage that are really important for students, and that then sometimes we forget because we do all this background work to get here. Um, or more likely, we run out of time because we're obviously all very pressed for time in the social studies classroom. Um, so. The idea here is that what most often students are used to, in, if they are asked to write at all in social studies classroom, they are used to writing summaries of information, They're both in their own writing and also in, um, in what they read, because that's how the textbook is written. So they don't necessarily have a lot of models of what it means to write an argument in social studies. It may not be true in your classroom, but when, but when they're coming to you, surveys have shown that this is what the tendency is in social studies classrooms. Um, and yet, obviously, arg argument writing has been a key emphasis for college readiness in the Common Core, and it supports the ways of inquiry we have um, laid out in the C3. Um, but argument writing is also important uh, not because other people say it is, but because it, it helps students develop their thinking and learn factual information. There have been different studies that show that students are able to remember more when they write arguments than when they write summaries. Um, so some considerations here are thinking through what, you're, what do your students already know about argument writing? And how is argument writing being taught in other subject areas at your school? And aside from argument, what are your students' incoming basic writing skills? So these are all important things to think about and have conversations with colleagues at work because your students are being asked to write. Um, and it's a question of what they're used to and what they think of as argument at this point. That Knowing that will help you work with them more effectively. And if you're, um, I'm assuming most of the people joining us are social studies teachers, uh, it's likely that you're, English counterparts have some kind of format for argument writing. And so thinking about your students moving from one class to another is important here as well. Um, what messages are they getting about argument writing in one class, and how does that compare to what you hope they'll be doing in your class? Um, so here's a poll for sharing some ideas uh, for a moment. Um, what do you expect your students to include in a written argument? When you ask them to write an argument, what are you hoping, expecting would be there? So take a moment to share your thoughts in the poll. I'm just reading Tom's ideas here, using some of the crime and puzzlement drawings from Lawrence Treat's book of that same name, Crime and Puzzlement. 
is a great way to start the year and get the kids in, into the mindset that they are investigators. I love that idea. I've never, I haven't seen that, so I'm going to check that out. Um, and George Hillix has a good book, Teaching Argument Writing, grades 6 through 12. That's a really good one to look at. So we are, I'm seeing a lot of overlap in what people are saying in terms of expectations for argument writing, claim or thesis, evidence, reasoning, supporting paragraphs. Um, so we have evidence. Some people are referring to facts. Um, and the idea of linking evidence to claim through their reasoning um, or warrant. Um, we've got different language being used. But there's a lot of overlapping ideas here. Um, dealing with a counterclaim is another important idea and argument. Um, students can do it in the, at the middle and high school level, but they probably won't if they're not asked to, at least in, in my experience. Um, so one thing you can see in the poll that's important is that I think there are a lot of overlapping ideas here, but the language we are using is slightly different, sometimes the same, and sometimes different. And that's important, again, to think about the student's perspective. Um, what you, you know, one person may call thesis, another may call claim, and, and it's helpful for them if people in, the, in their classrooms, they're, all of their teachers are using similar language, if they, in fact, mean the same thing. Um, so one, Tom is sharing the reasoning warrant is by far the hardest thing for my students to master, and I would agree. And I would say a big reason for that uh, is, is their reading and support for their reading. Um, so and that's where those reading, the structures to support reading and the discussion can really help students. And also the attention to analytical thinking while reading. So not only comp basic comprehension, but the ability to make inferences of what does this mean? Um, what is this person really saying? What is this person really after? Um, in history, I'd refer to it as historical thinking, so things like, you know, who is this author? Is this a reliable author? Um, is this, why is this person writing this? Or what time was this person writing this? Is this person, therefore, in a good place to report on these events? That kind of thinking is often what goes into reasoning in the writing it's, or the warrant. Um, it's part of why that evidence is a good piece of evidence for the claim. And so if they haven't done that level of thinking or that kind of thinking in while reading or discussing, it's hard to bring it up in writing because writing is very complex. Um, so right, obviously saying that they need names for the types of re type of reasoning they're using. Historical fallacies is one um, is one example of a, a, a book that provides some ideas there. In the work I've done, I've Again, we've used historical thinking, so attention to, and Kenny's bringing this up to sourcing, who wrote this, when, why, corroboration, comparing, contextualizing. All that work you do with the evidence goes into then the reasoning of why is this claim, why is this evidence rather a good piece of evidence for this claim. Um, Scott sharing another example, teaching arguments, rhetorical comprehension, critique, and response by Fletcher. Um, yeah, and context matters. So this is these are all the the reasoning that they're doing when they're reading. If it's history, is likely going to include context, um, noticing the different time periods people are writing and and what that means for the evidence that you're using, um, and that then comes into the writing. That's the warrant. That's the explanation for why this is a good piece of evidence. Um, so that's where that's why the reading is so connected to the writing to support that reasoning, and that's where discussion really helps with the included, inclusion of reasoning in writing. I want to highlight three strategies for teaching argument writing explicitly, um, and we started with the poll essentially to define what a written argument should include, um, and what we didn't do is decide well what is our final list of key aspects of a written argument, but also how would we then communicate those expectations to students? And there are different ways to do that. They can be through um, graphic rep representations of a text structure. I'll show you one of those. 
um, rubrics many people are familiar with, reflection guides where you have prompts to ask students to um, reflect on certain parts of their, their writing. So there are different ways to communicate to students what you expect of them, but in some way it's, super, it's certainly important to communicate um, what goes into a written argument and when you're going to read it, what are you looking for in a good argument. Um, as part of that, sharing and dissecting mentor texts help students see what a good written argument looks like. So earlier someone had suggested looking at different historians and how they disagreed on, on a, the same point. Those would be examples of mentor texts, but they could also be briefer um, examples of writing from other students, for example, uh, that, that share what an example of good argument looks like. Um, and students and you can pick those apart and say, all right, well, claim is one thing that we said was integral to a good written argument. So let's look at this example of a claim and what makes this a good claim? Um, evidence, okay, what makes this a good piece of evidence? Finding where that is in the mentor text and then talking about it um, is very helpful. And then modeling key aspects of writing like planning has been very important um, in my experience to help students use evidence to support their ideas and um, also to explain them. So I'll give some examples of each of these um, that come from the 2014 book I worked on with Susan De La Paz and Mark Felton and the ideas in this come from our work with eighth graders um, and eighth grade teachers of US history. So this is an example of a graphic representation of a, of a text structure. We called it how to write your essay um, in each box in this case, it was a very conventional um, text structure where it was a five paragraph essay. Each box represented uh, a paragraph of the essay and in each box it details what should be there and it's many of the things that you've raised like uh, a claim but then within each paragraph evidence and explanation. Um, and we clarified what the explanation is by sharing that it's uh, judging that evidence and why it's reliable or, or not. Um, and we also included rebuttal. So this is one way of communicating your expectations. Um, this was another way that we used, which was a reflection guide. Um, and in that we clarified several of the goals and then gave students a space to think about how they were doing with regard to those goals. This was also used as a peer editing guide that gave students a chance to look at each other's work. Um, so this is one example of a mentor text or a model text. Um, this one, Stacy, I see you asked a question about this. This is an example from a student um, that we thought was on the upper end of the group of students we were working with. It's not the whole example, but we used it to point out um, some key aspects of writing. And we've done it different ways where sometimes we use a, a true expert example, like a letter to the editor. And, and pull something from the newspaper. Um, but other times that so, looks so advanced to students that they feel they can't do it. And so it really depends, and then is, is um, a bit demoralizing and they can sort of shut down and not try. So it, it partly depends on who your students are, um, but I've usually looked for them in different places like newspapers or um, websites or places where people are, are sharing arguments in different ways. Um, currently working on a project where I'm trying to pull together a whole slew of mentor texts for different kinds of genres of writing argument and social studies. Um, modeling is, is key where you name whatever strategy it is. We use planning a lot and explain why it's important and use it in a way that students can observe it and think out loud while you're um, using that strategy and, and summarizing it. Again, just making explicit what it is that you did um, and then giving students a chance to try it out. Um, so for example, this is a sort of empty version of the text structure graphic representation that gave students space to plan. And we would model, or teachers with us or on their own would model, using this planning sheet to think out loud as they actually planned an essay. And they had their text structure next to them and they thought out loud about, okay, I'm gonna decide you know, whether this was about Shays' rebellion and whether they were rebels or freedom fighters. So I'm gonna decide that they were rebels and I'll circle that here. And then I'm gonna think through these supporting paragraphs and 
And so then you go through the process visibly in front of students and share your thinking about how you chose a strong reason and, and what quote seems to support that reason. Um, and, and then how you explain it. And sometimes this explanation and judgment of the quote uh, were one and the same thing. And that's, that was fine in our case, at least. Um, so let's see. I'm trying to catch up with some of the comments here. I've, I've fallen behind on some. Let's see. Um, Kenny had some good points about building sourcing in, contextualizing in, so that students are have that thinking when they get to the writing, and that's really important. Um, and yeah, I would agree. Historiography is a way of doing history. Tina brought up five paragraph essays, not what's recommended in, in ELA. I would agree. I mean, I think the project I'm working on right now is developing um, examples of writing tasks that have a real audience and purpose that are more authentic in that way and then don't necessarily have a five paragraph format. Um, the district we worked with in this project wanted the five paragraph format because they felt it would be most helpful. Um, for their students on the standardized tests that they had to take because they felt like that was what was really looked for in those tests. Um, but I agree, it's not necessarily the best way. It can give students a, a good structure to start with, but usually at some point they're ready to move beyond and it's just one way of teaching students the components of a written argument. Um, the goal setting strategy in the previous, this, this is a slide that's focused on modeling and so the modeling could be of many different strategies, and the example I had given was of planning an essay. And so this was one um, blank planning sheet that we used and then stood in front of students with our texts that we had read and with this planning sheet and thought out loud as we developed a plan um, and even sometimes then started to work together with the students to develop a plan. Um, and Tom shares another example of having students defend their decisions for evidence choices. Um, before they actually write, which is another nice way of helping students think through, you know, why am I choosing this piece of evidence? That's the same thing that this planning sheet is supposed to do, is think about what the claim is, but then how to select evidence that's actually relevant to the claim itself. Um, right, the five paragraph is very stiff and boring, I would agree. Um, it would be a good study to see if uh, students who have never been exposed to argument writing uh, don't get the five paragraph essay and others do and see if how necessary it is as a way to get into writing just to see structure if it's necessary at all. Okay, so in summary, I think I want to say, um, and there'll be a little space for Q&A, we'll probably go about five more minutes um, and then wrap up because it's late for many of you. Um, but just a summary comment is, I, I always find it very difficult to put together a presentation like this in just one hour because I, writing is, to me, not something that just happens at the end. You set the stage for writing in a lot of the decisions you make for your classroom before students are actually sitting down and putting a pen to paper, so to speak. Um, so I see writing as a process, and it requires attention to reading and thinking and writing, and all of that in the context of inquiry, where students have an opportunity to ask a question and come up with their own answer to it based on that evidence that they've looked at. Um, so the pieces that we've talked about today are doing history and social studies by posing debatable questions, presenting contrasting documents, supporting students' analysis and sorting and organizing of the evidence in different ways, um, like helping them with their reading. What came up in the chat is important in, uh, in that we need to support students' analytical thinking or, and inference making as they read, um, and that depends on the kinds of reasoning that you want them to do. For my, my work, um, it's been historical uh, reasoning. And um, the other piece was tracking ideas and, and comparing their ideas across sources and giving students a chance to discuss. Um, the last area that we've talked about is teaching argument writing explicitly, which is defining argument writing more visibly um, potentially than it has been, or at least seeing what how argument writing has been defined in different 
rooms in your class in your school buildings uh, to see what messages students are getting to find and dissect mentor texts and to model aspects of the writing process um, if we have time for Q&A you can add any questions concerns or opportunities you see um, right now as you're going in the chat and I'm just going to highlight a few of the next steps are to gather and I, I've found that people I've worked with including myself have learned the most by gathering and analyzing their students writing so that's that's an important next step or a step in the process of of working on writing whether you've done it for a long time or uh, you're new to it so you can think about to what extent students are including aspects of argument writing another activity that is useful partly for you and partly for your students is to create a rubric um, it could also be a, a graphic representation of text structure or a set of mentor texts um, that embody what you want argument writing to be um, and and convey that to students so that's another possible next step um, and then of course you can reflect on this particular investigation and plan what you want to do next um, the other thing that uh, other set of activities that are going to be posted so those will be posted on the literacy and learning exchange site and then there's another set of activities that will also be there um, which will help familiarize yourself with the common core and the C3 as they relate to argument writing um, they can give you support in finding or creating debatable central questions and document sets um, they can also there's also an activity to try out different discussion models with links to more information about structured academic controversies or inquiry and a suggestion to read the writing next report from the Carnegie um, Foundation okay so now we have some more ideas coming in on the chat that we can look at for just a moment um, so Scott share the NCSS is offering a MOOC this summer that explores historical reading and writing great um, thank you for sharing that and Kenny shared that there's some good examples of how to support an argument in decline and fall of Roman Empire um, and this is in Gibbon okay I may have missed some ideas there but I think I've got most of them um, these are some of the readings that support uh, what we've talked about there are a lot of others and this will all be posted on the Literacy and Learning Exchange site for you to see. Um, in addition, I am welcome email if you want to send me a note directly. I'm happy to be in contact with you. Um, and I would just say some of your comments are, um, are right now really relevant to me because I'm, I'm working with a school in developing um, types of writing that assignments that have a real audience and purpose. Um, and that, as Mary just brought up right now, link to students' lives in some way. Um, she's talking about being culturally responsive. Um, I agree, there's really not a lot out there right now to do that. Um, and, and so I'm hoping that, that we can, you know, I can continue to share some materials as they, as they come out. Um, and the other piece is just to see different types of writing besides the five paragraph ethics. I think there's a lot of possibilities out there. Um, other comments or questions? Got a couple of people typing right now. What is my next? Uh, thanks, Scott. I don't. I don't know. I'm actually p planning to put it all. The next project that I'm, the project I was just referring to, I'm planning to put it all online, so it's a little easier to access for people. So if you, um, you can check in with me via email, or you can check my University of Michigan faculty page. Would have a. It doesn't have anything there now except for basic description of me and my work. But eventually, it will have a link to that website. Um, it probably, in terms of timeline would be sometime after January 2016. So we're testing it out next year and learning about what students bring to the table um, in terms of their resources and knowledge so that uh, all year next year so that we can try to make 
um, the work more culturally responsive. So thank you all so much. I wish I could see you all individually and have an co individual conversation, but um, don't be uh, hesitant to be in touch. Um, and also remember that all of this, the investigation and all the next step items are part of a complete investigation that will be posted on the Literacy and Learning Exchange site. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Have a good night.